I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. What is it to practice? So life's happening. <laughs> it's raining, other people, politics, traffic jams, the internet doesn't work, you have a toothache, uh, you're getting older, uh, friends pass away, um, your kids don't call you anymore or enough. Things, life. All right, what do we do? What do we do? And if you know probably um, Viktor Frankl, who was dealing with I think the most awful conditions in life altogether, the Holocaust during World War II and uh, concentration camps. And in those settings, he famously wrote that um, there is a fundamental freedom, I'm paraphrasing here, inside all of us in how we choose to respond to our circumstances and our experiences. That choosing and that responding is the essence of practice. And the rest has to do with the details and skillfulness and appropriateness of various kinds of practices. In a sense, we can either be swept away by the storm willy-nilly, completely out of, out of effect, or we can locate, even if it's just one half of 1% of our own being, a place inside that is establishing a way of relating to what is happening uh, that is uh, good for us in some way and better than being completely swept away. That's what it means to practice. Uh, concretely, I think practicing uh, with our circumstances and with our own minds can be organized in three fundamental ways. Uh, we can, first of all, simply be with what's present. We can accept it. Uh, we can observe it. We can hopefully have some curiosity about it. We can be interested in it. We can um, investigate what's happening to understand it better. We're not changing it. We're not changing it. But we are being with it as a mode of practice. And a lot of um, contemplative practice is about being with what's there. Very important, very fundamental. Uh, additionally, we can work with what's there, which has two elements to it that the Buddha identified in his wise effort element in the Eightfold Path, and he also identified throughout his, his teaching. Uh, we can, uh, in terms of working with things, we can prevent or reduce or entirely release that which is painful, stressful, harmful, toxic, unwise, foolish, ignorant, deluded, and so forth. We can let it go. Uh, and also we can cultivate, we can grow, we can let in uh, and protect and increase that which is wholesome, useful, enjoyable, beautiful, um, awakened. So we have there these three modes of practice, letting be, letting go, and letting in. And as a longtime therapist and a longtime meditator and uh, someone who has some familiarity with a fairly wide range, not a full range, but a fairly wide range of psycho-spiritual traditions, uh, almost everything falls into one of these three categories. They work together. Uh, we often start by being with whatever we're feeling, and then we start shifting into releasing and then we start shifting into replacing what we've released uh, with something that's a, a beneficial alternative. I've written a lot about this. I actually think that in my Making Great Relationships book, I summarized letting be, letting go, and letting in, maybe in the second of 50 chapters in that, in that book, full of short chapters. So there's a good summary there. And you can find other things freely offered uh, online and um, and in my slide sets and on my website that I've shared about this. So that's a way of relating to practicing. Uh, we can't practice all the time. Sometimes we're just blown out of the water, or sometimes we're just kind of 
daydreaming, wandering, you know, just all over the place. But at least some of the time, right? Especially when things are challenging, are we bringing to bear an orientation to it in which we're helping ourselves, we're not defeated, uh, like Viktor Frankl, even in the most horrible of conditions, uh, we're retaining that fundamental human freedom and, and dignity in how we are going to relate to whatever's happening. And then kind of the rest of it is about skillful detail. So, so I'm going to be exploring here now two modes of practice broadly that can be applied to letting be and letting go and letting in, as well as to many specific things. And I'll make this quite specific and concrete as well as we explore what in Buddhism are the five hindrances or coverings of our true nature. Um, so myself, I um, had no idea how to practice bottom up for a long time. Uh, as a kid in fairly ordinary, you know, middle, middle class, suburban, Los Angeles, American, intact family, not abusive, not traumatic, uh, but in my own case, fairly unhappy circumstances. I, for different reasons, I was pretty unhappy as a kid, including relating to feeling very shy and, and uh, rejected and neglected, mainly neglected. Uh, with peers because I was very young going through school, which had pluses in certain ways. Um, but I just felt ugh, pretty unhappy about myself. So partly related to <laughs> wandering in the woods and the hills outside my home in a kind of determined way, and I think partly related to reading science fiction and partly related to my temperament and partly related to who knows what graceful forces in my own life, uh, I was, I became kind of determined from the top down to make a better life for myself. I didn't know how to do it, but I was determined to make that better life for myself. That's top down. There's a place for that. Uh, in psychology, we talk about executive functions, like um, being able to uh, sustain effort toward a goal, even if it's uncomfortable, uh, to be able to take a complicated problem or situation, break it into its pieces, work on the different pieces, and then assemble those pieces into a single result. Um, executive functions, you're monitoring. Uh, you're sort of the chair of the committee, you know, a, a strong chair of the committee of your own mind. <laughs> a lot of wayward characters in it. Executive functions, top down. Uh, you're giving yourself instructions, uh, verbal uh, systems uh, are often involved in the executive functions. It's no accident of neurological evolution that um, uh, executive functions having to do often with motor control, deliberate sequential motor control of skilled actions. Uh, you know, back in the you know the Stone Age or even before that. Um, when our primate ancestors were evolving and our hominid ancestors were learning how to make fire a million years ago with brains roughly half the size of our own. Still, they could do that. Um, those, ex exec those kind of uh, sequential, deliberate, planful motor functions are mainly located or a lot located in the left hemisphere of the brain for most people, which is also where language evolved. And because language too is sequential, uh, and, you know, involves a kind of a deliberate executive process. And those executive functions, and in both, whether it's behavioral, um, including with other people, uh, or um, having to do with inner speech, like you're talking yourself through things, or you're talking with other people to enact planned activity, as you're doing that, that is also quite related to the sense of self. So we have this triad, this kind of triad, an unholy alliance <laughs> of language, uh, including inner language, uh, planful action, and sense of self, which tends to be particularly left-sided for right-handed people and reversed for many left-handed people. Uh, that's a familiar way of being. Uh, 
people in our life and in school as we grow up call us to have a strong executive function. I wince, you know, <laughs> uh, as my kids remind me sometimes of ways in which I as sort of a, you know, a top-down sometimes kind of dad would just chastise my kids for uh, being out of control or not uh, restraining themselves in some way. That's also a kind of top-down function, you know, tight impulse control, reining in the inner horse, as it were, uh, of the body-mind process. Like, can't you get in control of yourself? Why do you do that to your brother or your sister or something, right? So we get chastised uh, for not having enough executive function. Then in school, we forget our homework, or maybe by nature, we're more kind of, you know, creative or mind-wandering or impulsive or stimulation-seeking. We're on the spirited end of the spectrum, and eh, you know we're, we're supposed to be in control of ourselves. And then you move into work situations, which in uh, modern industrial technical cultures tend to involve a lot of top-down uh, regulation uh, of our own thoughts and feelings and actions and complicated planned-out tasks. Woo! Neurons that fire together wire together, so we get heavily trained in these top-down ways of being. And you can also think about the ways in which modern cultures are increasingly disintegrated from, alienated from the natural world uh, with its own rhythms and organic processes. And you know, civilization is sort of imposing itself top-down on the natural world. I think about the tract homes in which I grew up, in which were laid out concrete, pavement, you know, in Dicondra lawns in Southern California, laid on top of what were um, very long-standing orange groves, which kept trying to break up through, you know, the cracks in the sidewalk uh, and these carefully, you know, manicured uh, landscapes. Um, and that, too, reinforces that top-down approach. There's a place for a top-down approach. You know, when the pilots and the engineers do their pre-flight checklist uh, of the airplane I'm about to embark on, whoo, <laughs> I want that top-down approach. <laughs> you know, um, I forget his name. Somebody wrote the checklist manifesto about the value of moving through, you know, kind of procedural top-down checking, whether it's, um, you know, getting a plane ready for a flight or a surgical procedure. You know, there's a place for top-down. And some people... You know, they can use a little more top down, right? And uh, you know who you are, or you know who they are, right? But on the whole, on the whole, hello, I, I'm Rick, <laughs> and I'm a top down alcoholic or something like that, right? Just admitting it, most of us, me included, have an overdeveloped uh, muscle, neurons that fire together, wire together. All those top down experiences leave lasting traces behind as habits. Habits of the mind. Okay, what about balance? What's the place of more bottom-up uh, ways of approaching life? And I want to uh, try to uh, flesh out a picture of a more bottom-up, uh, of um, not more, but of bottom-up approaches to life. And they're harder to describe because they tend to slip through the nets of language. They're more intuitive. Uh, they're less verbal, uh, they're more imaginal, uh, they tend to more bubble up beneath the waterline of awareness. And um, so they're kind of harder to talk about, but I'll, I'll do the best I can here. So bottom up, what I mean by that, one, is literally from the lower reaches of the body. You know, sensations in the body that are like little teachers saying, uh, being with that person, even though they sound good and top down, I'm thinking to myself, they tick my boxes as a fill in the blank friend, date, um, romantic partner, but bottom up, uh, there's a funny feeling around them. My body is telling me something. That's an example of the phrasing of bottom up. And as my Jungian therapist <laughs> said to me a long time ago, when we were exploring my dreams, he said, when the unconscious knows that someone is listening, 
it starts communicating more. I'm seeing things come in the chat. And by the way, this is wonderful for you to put examples in, especially of bottom-up guidance, bottom-up currents or forces in your own life that are really helpful to you. Like I'm seeing here from Jovian, gut instincts, intuition, right? Um, we can feel sometimes that bottom-up influencers are coming to us in ways that have a kind of supernatural or I don't know, but it's persuasive quality to us. You know, ancestral influences speaking to us. You know, guidance coming f really from the depths, you know, uh, potentially archetypal uh, influences, a kind of a voice speaking to us. We're not crazy. It, it's like a deep intuition. Uh, one of the, um, I nearly drowned one time in my life and it was a profound experience of trying to solve the problem of being trapped in kelp top down, which totally failed. And then there was a kind of collapse and release and, and um, from somewhere, There was a voice that said, cool it. And, and then I was able to un, unpack myself from the kelp I'd gotten twisted up in and, and gradually make my way to the surface. What is that? I don't know. I'm okay with not knowing. I don't need to squish that experience into some languaged little box. Bottom up. Now, by bottom-up influences, I don't mean um, unregulated volcanic rage. I don't mean just giving over to addictive desires that have this compelling quality to them. There's a balance here, top-down and bottom-up. But in this topic with you, I'd like to really uh, emphasize uh, bottom-up qualities. I'm seeing also like Elizabeth's comment at, at four minutes past the hour, the time zone might be different for you. I can feel it when someone is not authentic. Exactly, bottom up feels, has an authenticity to it. You know, top down, um, we can exercise a little top down regulation so that we don't, not everything comes out. <laughs> you know? There's a term logorrhea, diarrhea, logorrhea, just blah, 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 babbling everything that comes out. You know, we can exercise some guidance. But what does come out is, as Carl Rogers put it a long time ago, wonderful humanistic psychologist, um, we are congruent. That what we express to the world and what we are aware of internally uh, it lines up with what is actually true in our own depths. Okay? So, I want to apply uh, at a fairly brisk pace as an exploration uh, that you might like to pursue further. I'd like to apply this approach to what in Buddhism are described as the five hindrances. These are psychological, these are experiences or psychological factors or forces that hinder our progress or uh, maybe more accurately in terms of the early trans the early meaning of the ancient word in the language of Pali for that's translated as hindrance. Instead, thinking of these as coverings. They cover our true nature. They cover the light that is naturally already within us. And if you like, there's a lot of good practical psychology related to the five hindrances um, that you can explore further, including, if you want, at a wonderful freely offered resource uh, called Access to Insight. I think the URL uh, is accesstoinsight.org. So what are the five classic hindrances? I'll just name them briefly. And then I want to consider with you uh, both top-down and bottom-up ways of practicing with these hindrances in your own life. The first one typically listed is called sensory desire. We get attached to certain pleasures, you know, whatever they might be for you. Uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, um, 
I'm starting to get <laughs> addicted to political Twitter again. I thought I had, you know, broken that addiction. It's coming back. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe certain kinds of food, certain kinds of sexual experiences, certain kinds of um, forms of release, we can get attached to it. Okay, sensory desire. Second, what's often translated as ill will, you know, malice, vengeance, peevishness, wanting to punish others, wanting to get back at others, um, you know, hostility, resentment, ill will. We know what that's like, right? Third, what's to me humorously traditionally translated as sloth and torpor, sloth being like yeah, laziness, torpor being kind of de-energized and sleepy. Uh, you know, this is about, in a way, not making an effort. Uh, we just go, uh, phone it in, you know, we don't do our best. We just, eh, we don't have any juice for it. Uh, now, sometimes health issues get in the mix there. That's very important. Or mood, because one of the hallmarks of depression is a lack of motivation, and often combined with a, a physiologically a grounded fatigue. So, um, you know, the, what can look like more psychological uh, lack of um, kind of energy for something can also have a physical component to it that I want to acknowledge sympathetically. Okay, onward. Then the fourth classic hindrance is often translated as restlessness and remorse or restlessness and worry. And this is a sense of agitation, feeling unsettled, unable to kind of settle in. That's different from being temperamentally kind of distractible toward the ADD-ish, you know, end of the spectrum. Um, you're, you're just fragmented and scattered and rattled, okay? And then last, doubt. It's sometimes said that doubt is the uh, uh, most consequential and most challenging uh, hindrance of all since anything can be doubted. Doubt that undermines your sense of your own worth, doubt about yourself, doubt about others that leads to the need for continual reassurance, uh, doubt that you've actually done a good enough job and can move on. It's really okay. You did it. You can move on. Uh, you don't need to keep checking something. You can move on. Um, doubt. Okay? So now let's explore some ways to practice bottom up with each of these. Another aspect of bottom up, and I, I want to really name this, it's, this is very alive for me these days and central to practice, is a sense of being lived by everything. Lived in unfolding waves. And that can start opening out, you know, you might have a sense of being like the mountain rooted in the earth, lived by the earth, with an open heart, with an open mind, um, as a local expression of the universe as a whole. Or to use the metaphor uh, of being a local wave in the ocean of reality, or a local current in the river of time. Well, any of these, you're being made, and the, and the nature of this local current uh, and the nature of the wave, let's say, is, of course, water. The nature of every thought and thing is the same, you know, made of parts that are connected and changing and connected ultimately out into everything, uh, occurring, uh, as the Buddha taught, in a, a um, diff difficult to talk about but still real underlying unconditioned ground through which condition, in which, through which, as which, whatever, conditioned phenomena, including your own body-mind process, are occurring. Huh, that's very deep, isn't it? And, you know, the sense of um, openness to and accessibility to over time uh, can grow to that sense of being lived by everything. That, too, is a very important kind of uh, bottom-up influence in our life. So in a way, I'm talking here about how can we uh, surrender. Top-down is not surrendered. Top-down, including in ways that are virtuous, is directive. It's penetrating. Right? Bottom-up is more surrendered. 
it's given over to that which, let's say, is arising and living through you in good ways and carrying you along. Top down helps us have a little useful executive discernment about the things that seem to be living through us that are beneficial and some that are not so beneficial. We have a little discernment there. But generally speaking, there's a familiar sense of, of um, what is wholesome and wise and beneficial coming up and living through us. Let's look at this in terms of each one of these five hindrances. And I want to give you an example. So sensory desire. Think of something that you like and a lot and then tend to want a lot that may have some short-term gain, <laughs> but long-term pain. What might that be? You know, binge watching TV or clicking through YouTube, um, you know, videos about various topics of interest, I confess, uh, food, drugs, alcohol, you know, pleasures of different kinds, whatever it might be. Maybe there's something, this may not speak to you, but maybe there is something that, you know, it's hindering you. It's covering over your true nature. Well, top down, you could make a list of the costs of that particular thing. You could, you know, organize your pantry so you, and your refrigerator so you don't have those things in them. You know, you could do those things. There's a, there's a place for that. You could, you know, frankly, top down has some risks of being bossy and mean and critical and punishing and harsh toward yourself. You know, bad Bad Ricky, bad Ricky, still wanting that fill in the blank. Bad, bad. All right? Top down. How about bottom up? Well, bottom up might be being aware of and kind of in tune with a sense in your body of feeling really healthy and content as you are. You know, really... Um, aligned with what is truly long-term healthy for your body. You, could have, you might get in touch with the sense of that in your body. Oh, and, a, and be increasingly given over to that feeling in your body when it is eaten in healthy ways, when it has, you know, released, disengaged from intoxicants, because as the Buddha said, intoxicants cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. You're, you're disengaged from that. You're centering yourself in a different way of being. You don't have to push yourself um, away from those sensual desires. You've simply centered in a, a feeling of being that is free of them. Oh. There could even be a sense of, of, of feeling happy and pleasured in ways that are farther reaching and healthier for you with fewer costs, more profound even, more elevated in a good sense, more elevating. You could give yourself over to other pleasures that crowd out and replace the problematic sensory desires. These would be ways from the bottom up. You could feel already completely content uh, in a sense of awestruck gratitude in being lived and conscious, and conscious of being lived by everything. Wow. Okay. How about ill will? Well, top down, you could say to yourself, nah, don't be so mad at them. All right. And other kinds of things. Um, you could try to talk yourself out of your feelings, okay. Bottom up, for example, you could open to uh, a, a kind of unconditional open-heartedness and goodwill toward all beings while reserving rights, of course, to you know adjust the size of your relationship and the type of your relationship uh, with other people depending on how trustworthy they are or, what they're like or what it's like to be around them. You can certainly adjust those things while still retaining an increasingly unconditional, almost like a Wi-Fi base station in your heart, 
radiating of a fundamental good wishes toward others, including those that um, you disagree with politically or feel in the sake of justice, you know, require some kind of punishment. Uh, I say these things quite carefully. You know, we can be a, we can be aware of a moral. We can look at, out at the world with a moral view that sees what it sees and values what it values, including others that, you know, um, are not, you know, are, are, are behaving in ways that are harmful. We can do all that while retaining this fundamental goodwill and good wishes that does not let hatred invade and poison the heart, right? That would be bottom up. Uh, we might have a kind of global perspective coming up from the depths about the big picture. You know, tyrants come and go, kings and queens rise and fall. Um, this is a tiny little planet, you know, in the big Milky Way galaxy, which is a tiny little galaxy in the Big Bang universe amidst another trillion or two trillion other galaxies. I mean, you know, that bottom-up perspective uh, can uh, ease us out of ill will, all right? Sloth and torpor, uh, you know, as Wikipedia puts it here, half-hearted action with little or no effort or concentration. Um, so we could, you know, have some kind of inner Tony Robbins. I like Tony Robbins. I actually did a workshop with him a million years ago. As little I know, okay, I'm not putting him down, but you know that that attitude, get off the couch, you know, get going, rise, rise and shine, you know. Um, yeah, we could do that top down. You know, I've do, I do that with myself. Come on, Rick, go get on the treadmill, do your thing, time to do it. Stop whining, start climbing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right. But bottom up, are, can we tune into energies within us, passions for the good that are native to us? Maybe even they feel like they're connected to, you know, life itself, the natural world, the sun is shining, you know, the birds are chirping, there's an aliveness and aliveness in us that lifts us and rises us and moves us forward. Right? Can there be an opening to that? Here too uh, is a good way to make a point that we can use top-down approaches to invite and unleash bottom-up forces, influences, currents that are really good for us. So for example, um, you might top down, remind yourself of what you really love, what you really care about, and direct your attention. You know, the, the um, executive regulation of attention is top down and it's very useful. You can direct your attention to um, the things in your that you really care about that are that are really important to you and which give you energy you feel uh, an energy from whatever that might be including an energy for awakening an energy for practice um, you know love by the way is very energizing you know the valuing of love and being loving and being lived by lovingness, moving through oneself in, uh, un in ways that are not contingent, so, or that are less and less contingent on your circumstances or who you're with, or simply increasingly, you're naturally an, an expressively loving person more and more and more. That's a way to um, deal with the hindrance of, sl of sleepiness, lack of energy, laziness, lack of motivation love, okay? Restlessness and worry. So, uh, you know, or remorse, you know, we're, we're negative rumination. This is negative rumination territory a lot. All right, so top down, you could say snap out of it. You could use like a therapeutic technique, supposedly. I never recommended it. You wear a rubber band and as soon as you start to ruminate about something or obsess about something as a form of rumination, you snap the band. It's 
It's mildly uncomfortable, but it's enough of like a ding, zings you out of it. All right, you could tell yourself to do those things. Okay, I got it. On the other hand, bottom up, there could be the giving of forgiving of yourself. You could open to a kind of soothing balm of blessing of yourself that seems to come. It's you, and yet it's sort of not you. You know, there can be an opening in the in awareness to um, forces, or you can imagine beings, perhaps actual beings in your life, or um, in, in more imagined beings, uh, you, potentially angelic beings could be, whatever, uh, that are kind to you and are uh, releasing you and soothing you related to what you're uh, restless or remorseful or, or worried about, what you're ruminating about. And sometimes, guy, this is a very important point as well, bottom up, sometimes there's a real clear guidance. Um, I've had phrases arise in my mind that really came from the bottom up and I listened to them. Phrases were, don't be a fool. And it wasn't like this harsh shaming, don't be a fool, don't be a sinner, don't be a fool. No, no, no. It was more like uh, wisdom. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of Gandalf at the bridge and Bardur about to be sucked down by the Balrog, so, you know, holding onto the bridge and looking at his friends who are wanting to help him but can't. And if they try to help them, they'll all die. And he says, run, fools. You know, it's a wise guidance, you know, that can come from the bottom up that can tell us, you know, you need to get going. Uh, you need to, uh, only you will write this book. You know, that kind of clarity has arisen in me and, and, and it was really important from the bottom up. So there can be guidance from the bottom up you know, guidance, as well as forgiveness coming from the bottom up, uh, guidance to deal with what you're worried about and remorseful about or preoccupied about, to so take action, action binds anxiety, as Angela Sarian said, that's guidance coming from the bottom up, has a feeling of um, persuasion, and it's like a rising tide to like get out of the way of doing what's necessary to deal with what you're ruminating about as best you can, while also in a really sweet and tender kind way from the bottom up, you know, like forgiving you and encouraging you and, and being nice to you <laughs> from the bottom up, okay? And then last doubt. Again, we could get into uh, cognitive therapy methods where we list our doubts like on the left side of a line written down the middle of a page and then start listing counter arguments that argue against the doubts. You know, there's a place for that, especially if you believe the counter arguments. But often we'll do that. We'll try to talk ourselves out of our self-doubts or our doubts about others or our doubts about doing some project that our bottom-up intuition says, come on, you could do it. You want to do it. T or take a chance, you know. Let someone know you like them. <laughs> you know, or let someone know that you feel hurt by them. Uh, you know, and so these these you know that can be an inclination that then again we can doubt, doubt, doubt. So how to deal with doubts from the bottom up? All right. One of the I think it's the five one of the five spiritual powers. They're called powers uh, in uh, Buddhist psychology or practice is conviction sometimes translated as faith. Uh, not faith as a kind of blind faith, maybe there's a place for that too, but this is informed faith, where you this develop a sense of conviction. For example, a conviction in the truth, generally speaking, and usefulness of the Dharma, the teachings uh, of um, the Buddha, or conviction about the sincerity of this teacher and a willingness to give him a chance, uh, even if you're not so sure yet conviction, a conviction in your own deep good nature, your own Buddha nature or your own true nature, conviction about that. So conviction is a bottom-up antidote to doubt. We might 
get to conviction a little bit through a rational process that's top down, maybe language centered, but the fruit, the proper fruit of that top down process related to doubt is a bottom up trust in what you know to be true. That's conviction. And so there can be an opening into and a surrendering to trusting what you really know to be true. Now, now you may engage in useful tests that help you strengthen and, 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 and develop conviction about your bottom up trust in what you know to be true. And still the ultimate fruit of that is a bottom up knowing, a bottom up feeling of what is actually real, what is actually true. All right. So I did this fairly briskly, uh, and um, you can see what I'm trying to do here, and you can do it yourself. You, particularly if you're like me, and I think the great majority of people, uh, you are inclined primarily probably toward top-down approaches, and you can take a little time to explore what would be bottom-up approaches. Uh, for issues you have, whether they fall into the categories of the five hindrances, the five coverings, um, or if there's something much more specific, you know, uh, top down or bottom up. Okay. Well, that was quite a run, and I hope that was useful for you. Uh, I would just say, if I were to finish here, the fundamental good news. Top, the top-down approach sort of implicitly has built into it that if I don't exercise top-down control, guide, you know, regulation of some kind, all hell will break loose. <laughs> you know? The id will erupt, <laughs> chaos will reign. Ah! Right? There's some. There's an implicit notion there, and uh, in the top-down approach. Uh, you know, to some extent, we do need to regulate ourselves. You know, the the you know the mind brain system evolved, and it's kind of a jungle in there. Okay, okay, okay. And still, it's you know it has a certain view that's not so trusting. Bottom up approaches, implicit in them, are a view and a feeling that deep down inside, all is well. We may not be in touch with it at all. It might be very elusive, but deep down inside, ah, it's good stuff there. That the rising wellspring inside you is good. And that the making, you know, what reality makes is sometimes tragic and uh, unjust and, and horrible. If, if, if as simple, not simple, but such as an enormous storm system moving through the Caribbean and affecting many, many people there, including people I know. Um, so what reality makes isn't always pretty. Uh, I'm not trying to talk us out of seeing clearly, including deliberate acts Reality is making those deliberate acts of those uh, actors who are harming many others. What is made can be good or bad, depending on our value system. And you, there's no escape from values. But the makingness in reality, the ongoing givingness of reality, the constructing of reality continuously at the front edge of now, Wow, the makingness of reality is extraordinary. And we're being continually, continually lived by that at the front edge of now. And so that's a kind of big way that we can increasingly grow into a felt sense of, of appreciating uh, what we can also appreciate in more intimate and down to earth. And, you know, easier to talk about kind of ways that um, our depths are good. There's great wisdom there. We can trust ourselves in a deep way. 
And that's at the heart of this approach to living and approach to um, solving our problems and, and practicing and, and, and um, having relationships that we can be increasingly open to um, the goodness in bottom-up influences.